commercial beforehand. We're live. Here we go. All right. All right. Well, so good to have all of you joining us here tonight. We're here with Pastor Brian and we're with Paul Huber. Paul, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Good. Good, good. Well, we're so thankful that you took time out of your busy schedule to be here with us. And we really want to discuss and ask you some questions about your new book, Killing Complacency. And uh, so we're really excited about that. But before we do, Pastor Brian, I want to ask you a question. I know that the governor today uh, released some other businesses. I know movie theaters are in that category. How does that affect CR First? Does that move up the opening? What does that look like moving forward? Yeah, so we've been working on this quite diligently and watching everything. It actually does. It changed some things today for us. So uh, what we're looking at, we're, we're already in process for this week. We, we were not able to open up on the 24th. And what we know is for us to be able to handle all the things that we're going to need to do, cleaning and in and out. And we need one week that's just kind of a, we're calling it a soft lunch, yeah. um, be a special invite. And uh, we're, we're still going to do kind of a video sermon, um, but we'll have a few people in and we're just going to do one service. So um, people that are watching here probably have access, we'll see, but um, it's going to be very limited invitation to the 31st, but really with on June 7th. Uh, we're going to open up. We're going to have three services. And uh, as of right now, it looks like we're going to do um, a service at 9, 11, and 1 p.m. all on Sunday. Come on. Woo. So we, we, we know we, we have to space chairs and have social yeah. distancing, and uh, we have to clean in between services. There's pretty mm. still significant um, recommendations, guidelines that we have to follow as we walk through this and are open to the public. And uh, we're looking forward to it, though. So it's good. We're going to still continue everything online that we've been doing. That's not going to be any different. Okay. What we're doing up to this point, we'll still be fully online and fully available. But I'm looking forward to just the chance that we have to move forward and start having, you know, time together. Yes. Uh, with each other. Yes. And encouraging. So I'm going to be putting an update on social media in the next two okay. days and update our website with all the what this means. But it's we're, we're moving forward. And uh, yeah. Um, like I said, well, Memorial Day weekend this weekend and encourage people to, to I, I can't wait. It's a great message. I'm excited about it. And uh, the following weekend, 31st, actually, I asked um, Alan Griffin, who was with us in the winter. I remember. To be part of this series. And so he's going to be, he put a message together just for our church, just for this series, um, specifically to, to communicate. It's going to be great on the 31st. And then we're going to launch into our um series on the book of Romans. And uh, so our services will be a little shorter in person. Yeah. You know, some people will be bringing kids um, and we'll have some busy bags for the kids to help. But parents, we're going to encourage parents to kind of, you know, take some ownership with, as a family. But I know we've been talking to a lot of people, doing a lot of homework, and we have many that are ready to be back in yesterday. And some know that having their kids at service is going to be tricky. So they might wait a little bit longer and that's totally fine. We get it, man. Wherever people are at their comfort level, um, we don't want people to come and feel overwhelmed or feel as if they're, they don't uh, connect or, or maybe, you know, just emotionally um, and health wise. Uh, we, we've got some others. I think one of the, the hard ones this week for me was uh, Alo Bell, who's uh, I think the oldest person is part of our church. She's a hundred years old. It's at a birthday party earlier this year and, um, she just was confirmed with coming down with COVID uh, and the home that she's in. And so, you know, this is impacting our church in, in many different ways. And uh, we want people to be healthy and be safe and um, handle things wise and as adults, which I think yeah. I know everyone will. But so the plan is June 7th will be uh, probably about 200 people, you know, two or 300 people for each service, kind of the goal. And uh, that should give us more than enough to for people to come back and worship together. Come on. I know that is going to make a lot of people happy to hear that news. I know we have had so many people just can't wait to get back and to see one another again. And so June 7th, get ready. Uh, the church doors will officially be open. And so uh, now I want to turn kind of our direction here. And Paul, I want to kind of ask you some questions about your new book. This is so exciting. And uh, your book is titled Killing Complacency. And so what inspired you to write this book? Well, Pastor Nate, I, it, it, 
I, I guess I have to be honest here. I, it really came as a surprise to me. I wasn't yeah. wait. I didn't wake up one morning and say, Hey, I want to write a book. I woke up one morning and said, I've been learning a few things and I want to do this one page study about what I thought was important at the time, which was the growth mindset and the infinite God that we serve and how yeah. the, the two can play together. That's and I, I got into a little bit, I did this one page study with the guys at church mm -hmm. and then I, I wasn't completely satisfied with that. I'm like, man, yeah. I've been learning a lot of, a lot of things lately. I've been reading a lot of books, listening to a lot of great speakers. And I want to try to, at least for my own purpose, get my philosophy together and just get it down on paper. And th that's all I really wanted to do was just kind of outline things and kind of out figure out yeah. what it was that I was looking at and what I was thinking about. And over time, over the last couple of years, it's really evolved from just that basic outline of what I was thinking and, and trying to, if you will, just trying to figure out some of the, the dichotomies I see and some of the the things that I felt maybe didn't motivate me the way they should. Mm -hmm. And just trying to figure, sort all the things out. And through that process, it, it morphed from, well, man, I've got this idea to, wow, this this is tens of pages. And now it's 170 <laughs> some pages. I yeah. just can't stop. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. That kind of is where it started for you. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't something that you just said, I want to do all this, but it just continued to build and build. And like you said, to have the amount of pages that you you've written, um, you know, killing complacency in order to kill something, you have to know what it is. And so like for you, what did complacency look like in your life? You know, how did you discover it? Cause I know a lot of people are going to read your book and go, okay, you know, I need to figure out how I can do that too. So kind of walk us through what that looks like in your life. Right. So I think part of it was just trying to, to sort out the difference between comp contentment and complacency and mm. trying to, yeah. if you will, you know, slice that, the, the two sides of the same, what seemed like the same thing apart. Yeah. And we, we hear the message a lot about um, the apostle Paul and, and saying, I'm content in having a lot. I'm content in having a little and the, the things that he experienced and how he encouraged contentment, but it was clear that he wasn't complacent. It was yeah. clear that he wanted to spread the gospel to all of Asia, to all of the, the known world at that time. And he, he talked about pressing forward, pressing forward. And so to me, that difference was, understanding what you have, what you have to work with, and then, and being content with who you are, how you're made and what you're, you feel you're called to do, mm. but still pressing forward and not being satisfied with the status quo and, and understanding where it is that you need to grow, where you need to push forward. And I saw that kind of in my own life uh, in terms of, well, maybe I wasn't pushing forward hard enough at work or pushing forward hard enough in my marriage or you know, mm. at, at any of the, some of the other important things in my life. And so there was really a lot of trying to figure out what the right way to push forward was. And so I, I dug in there and tried to dig into that difference between uh, contentment and complacency. So that's really part of how the book opens is yeah. understanding the big lie of contentment because Contentment is important, but when it turns into complacency, that's kind of the, the bad side of content. That's good. That's I good. love the question you asked, Nick, because, you know, how do you, you have to know if you're hunting, right? If it's rabbit season, you yep. uh, quote, or duck, duck season or rabbit season, right? You got to know which one, which yep. season it is. Yep. And I think, you know, most of the time people do, un, don't really under, they don't really understand the definition of what contentment is. Uh, contentment is biblical or a deep seated yeah. contentment. I don't need anything else in my life. And sometimes people think that a, that a drive and, and I know Paul, you, you, we've talked about this too, that sometimes people think a drive is maybe it pulls away from our spirituality. Um, but I, I don't see it that way. I think God's created us to be driven. He's created us to chase and to get the best. What contentment is, is though, is that drive doesn't motivate my soul. 
it doesn't motivate my being it doesn't motivate my purpose um it 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 is me getting the best yield out of what god's placed in me and uh you know there's those are very two very different things complacency i think is my biggest um frustration i think right now we're going to see i'm talking about a little bit on, on sunday too because we're, we're seeing that in happen with isolation. Uh, there is all kinds of complacency that's taking place right now. And so I, I want to talk to you, Paul, maybe a little bit. How do we, how do you define, because you, you talk about this, because I think success is our duty, right? You, you know, yeah. it's mm-hmm. phrase you use in your book um, that we do have an obligation to be successful. And, and there's different ways people can take that, right? One way people can take that is, that well, you have to be driven and step on anybody at any cost and cheat and and just drive, drive, drive. Don't have a family, uh, you know, it can wreck your family. We've we've seen it when when the contentment's not right, but that drive for success will, can be devastating. But scripturally and spiritually, what did you learn on this journey about success and really God's call to us in this? There, there's probably two aspects I want to emphasize here. One is that we're all here to, to serve one another. And whether that's leading a church or mowing a lawn, you know, whatever the task is, we're here to serve our fellow humans. And the result of that, if you're doing it well, if what you're doing is valuable and you, and you serve in a way that helps other people and, and is valuable to them, that should come back as, as something that where you get paid to do it. And yeah, there's certainly things where we want to volunteer, we want to help others out of the goodness of our heart. But the, the work aspect and the, the aspect of our lives where we do get that income in exchange for the time that we spend at something or the value we provide to someone else, that, that's important. And it, I think sometimes we lose sight of that and we, we over spiritualize the the guy behind the pulpit versus well that's his calling and he's called to do that but the guy or gal serving coffee or mowing a lawn or engineering a gps receiver those are all important roles and there's nothing less spiritual about it it's just a different calling and i see a lot of christians just saying well i'm not as spiritual as this guy or that guy that's up in front of everyone else and well that's not my calling and so if i'm not living out my calling i'm not being obedient to god yeah it's certainly a great job to have a very important role but it, if we lose sight of well my time right now is supposed to go here my calling maybe evolves over time but we, we just kind of lose sight of what the the importance of serving others yeah. and doing our job well. Yeah, I think it's so key because um, I've, I've wrestled with that over the years, right? For many years, I trained young people to go to ministry and other things and I would help them understand this calling. All of us are called. Every person is called to follow God, to serve him. And then there's specific roles that we fulfill. There is no one more spiritual than anyone else. Um, all of us, like even the pastor's role is to help equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, to help people do the ministry and do what you're called to do and, and to chase that and to think that, well, I'm not, I'm lesser. But even roles that we do in the church, we run into that, you know, quite a bit. So uh, just opening a door for somebody like that is huge. We don't understand how that, how God uses that and everything yep. that we're doing, we should do it with the level of excellence and, and focus. That's right. I love Paul because you, you did the parables, all right, and uh, he kind of took on like the talent, um, which is always an interesting that we use that terminology, and uh, because most of us think talents is like Michael Jordan talents, um, and it, it's a financial resource is really what we're talking about there. But what did you learn, you know, when you when you dug into those those parables? Well, the. The, the thing that strikes me when I dig into the parables is it's not uh, a story of something that actually happened. It's purposely written or told in a way that Jesus chose. He could have it end any way that he wants. But when you look at it, you look at the, the 
guy that got the five talents initially and turned it into 10, he, he's, the master said, good and faithful servant, well done. He, he multiplied that financial resource. And the guy, the servant that got two talents had the same sort of response. But the one that was given one talent, he had it taken away from him. I mean, that wasn't just an example of something that happened in, in a story that Jesus heard about. It was his message. If you are not faithful with even getting that little bit, it will be taken from you. And yeah. so, you know, I see a lot of people being financially irresponsible. And it's that idea of that talent they've been given, the little bit of money they've had is taken away from them because they've not been responsible with it and work to multiply it. Mm. That's, that's great. I think I'm saying that I love how you're saying it because it is critical that we understand all these pieces that we have in our life are spiritual. Yep, like that, right. yep. I think most people forget this is all of our spiritual work. It's a part of our spiritual uh, journey. Um, we, it, it's not, there isn't, we used to kind of went through a cultural piece where this is secular and this is sacred. And we have to live our lives in a way that everything is sacred. There, there isn't a secular piece of my life. Every part of that's paying bills. Um, that's what I purchase. That is, you know, the subscriptions I have a part of. It's how I use my free time. Um, it's what TV shows I watch and what things I interact with online. Everything is sacred because mm -hmm. it's all a stewardship process of what God's given us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, absolutely, there's a, a time for rest and recuperation and preparing for that next season or the, the next day even, right? Getting that good night's sleep. And so it's important to do things like that. But Proverbs really gets into, well, don't go past what's necessary. And because, you know, a little folding of the hands, a little reclining and relaxing, it, it turns into life's a sloth or not doing what you were meant to do. And yeah. the important thing about success is if you don't succeed, who else loses? I mean, does mm -hmm. it, your family doesn't have what they need. You're not able to give to the church to, to do the other things. And yeah, we, a lot of people hit rough times and a lot of people have challenges. And right now is a tremendously challenging time for, for many people. But at some total at the macro level of, of a person's life, are they working towards being successful and making the most of what they've been given or are they just getting by or, or, or worse expecting someone else to help them out? And yeah. I, I love, cause I think it's, you're right. We can't, we can't look at rest as, as a negative because scripturally what Bible talks about a Sabbath, Mm -hmm. And it's teaching, I wish we did more actually the we're launching something called emotional healthy spirituality, where we talk about Sabbath quite a bit. But most people in America, what we do is we work until we crash, right? Like we work so we can rest. And scripture reverses it. Scripture says, no, you rest and you pour out from that. Your work is poured out. You work from your rest. That you feel your rest isn't about collapsing and just doing nothing. At rest from a scriptural perspective is filling up. So yeah, that's good. Pour out. So I'm filling up. I'm I'm physically ready. I'm emotionally healthy. I'm I'm spiritually ready. I'm intellectually filled up. So then I can pour out and and go. And in most of us, we kind of look at we kind of go work stop, <laughs> work stop, and that's just not the scriptural approach to how we're to chase after and how we're to pour out from what God's given us. Right. And, and athletes have a term called active recovery where they'll, they'll do the tough workout one day and then the next day or, or a couple of days later, they'll do a small workout to get the lactic acid and the other things out of the, their system. And, you know, I think in, in the non-athletic term or view of that, it's like, well, spend your morning doing the intellectually challenging things, the really hard things. Uh, midday and later do the things that are less challenging and in the evening use your time to recover uh, and and not in a way that completely checks out but you know read a book do other things that help you learn and build and prepare so that you can work with the natural flow of your energy throughout the day and and to not overdo it or and and to not underdo it 
There's a chapter in your in your book, Paul, that I'm really interested in. I just want you to elaborate on it. It's chapter 10. It's called The Passion and Purpose, Driving Your Life. How does that title fit into the book, Killing Complacency? That, that chapter and the, the title and the, even the contents there, it, it picks at some things I think are, are pretty common myths and misconceptions, okay. right? Yeah. There, there are a lot of people that expect that, call from heaven, the, the voice to say, your purpose is to do this, or yep. that, that overwhelming passion that they get at the end of high school, right? I mean, yeah. you, you, at the end of high school, you're supposed to go pick a college major and then go spend the next 40 years after college doing that major. And the reality is people often find things that they're passionate about and get excited about, not by going to, not by just having that come upon them at the end of high school, it, it's really something that you discover over time. Mm. And you can spend a, a season, and high school is a great time to do it, but even young adult years, spend a season trying to figure out what you like, try to figure yeah, out what's good. enjoyable, and then pursue the thing that gets you excited. I, there's a great example in the book Grit by Angela Duckworth, where she talks about how it, it the, the passion doesn't come up upon you all of a sudden. It's there, there was someone that was in the janitorial business. It's not glamorous or sexy or wonderful, but they're, they're in the business and they really developed a passion for that after having been there a while and having some favor in their life for it. And they've really, they, they built a big business out of it. And it's, it's not something you, you get done with high school and yeah, I'm passionate about basketball or, or, um, or art or whatever, but you, you get into doing the job and you get some, you, you find kind of that field of favor, if you will, and you start pursuing that. Where have you had success? And mm -hmm. really pursuing those things that that give you the decent reward and that you get excited about and and don't wait for that that voice from heaven. Yeah. It's it's the same way with motivation. Motivation doesn't come from the spark that propels you forward. It's you start moving forward and then you feel motivated to do more. So I think one of the things I want to encourage those that are we have several that are on YouTube and some quite a few that are on um, Zoom as well. If you want to put a question for for Paul, for us, we'd love to answer those. We, we love chatting about this. It's kind of just fun. We just get together <laughs> chat. This is fun for me. Um, I know next week I've got Dr. Joseph Lear um, coming in and he's going to connect with us. And then I got Dr. Alan Tennyson and Dr. Mark Zweifel and Dr. Carolyn Tennant. Also, a lot of, a lot of friends. Uh, I love that Paul's with us. And, and really, Paul, even the book that you talked about, you and I have talked quite a bit. We've been connecting a lot of different things. Um, the Grit by Angela Duckworth is a fantastic book. Like, those kind of things are, are good. Like, what other things have you been reading that have just been inspiring you? The, one of the big inspirations lately is I joined uh, a group called 100X and the, the speaker there is Pedro Deo. And he's been talking a lot about some of the same principles that I had and, and worked through as I discovered the book or worked on the book. And I, I got basically done with it and found his community on, on Facebook. And it's, it's very much aligned uh, with what I've been thinking. It's, it's talks about kingdom entrepreneurship and talks about what it means to 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 use the talents you've been given. So that's that's really been my latest inspiration, if you will. Uh, I I did a count. There's something like 70 books cited at the end of of my book. So there's a lot that went into it. And and what I I tried to do is just synthesize what came in from all those books and correlate it that with scripture because what the Bible tells us is true and important. And, and, you know, I try to filter everything I read and learn through that, but there, there's so much else out there that's instructive and that helps us learn more and, and different and deeper things about life and, and how we're made. And so I really looked at a lot of different sources as I went through the book. I think, there's, a, there's an old adage, and I'll get in trouble for saying this, but I'll say it anyway, because that's um, it's my job. Um, but, you know, so many people say, the only book we should ever read is the Bible. I'm like, well, the Bible is 
the key book for you to read in your life, but you need to read more than that. You know, otherwise you're just, you can end up stupid. You know, like, like this is part of God's put things in front of us to learn, to glean, to encourage. Mm -hmm. Here's the piece that always got me on that. Jesus, when he taught, did not teach the whole Bible. Jesus, when he was here, he only taught specific things that had application to how do we live this out. And so God's giving us the brain and the resources, and he wants to work. We're going to talk about this this is Sunday. God wants to elevate our mind um, to make sure that we are approaching things right and using what he's given us and think deeper and better. Um, someone had a question, and it's kind of interesting one. I think when you're starting to chase something, so purpose, you're talking about it. Do you, do you have to have an idea first or do you just start just start doing something? Do you try to plan it out or so you just start doing? What do you think? Right. You know, I get in trouble with some of my engineering friends where they say, well, you don't have the whole picture together or you don't have all the, the plans together. Well, I, it's not, I'm not a bullet, right? I, I can aim, I can fire and then aim and, and adjust and, but you have to do something, right? You, you can't find direction without at least doing something and figuring it out. So, and, and the, the great thing about my situation writing the book is I, I've got a full-time job and another side hustle. I, I don't have to write a book. I, it's not, I'm not dependent on getting that, that one thing done. And so I've had the luxury of exploring and figuring it out. And, and the draft that you saw was nothing like what the, the first draft was. I, I got, I got through it. And then I looked at uh, this book about how to, how to frame a story called the story grid. And that really helped me kind of see, well, how can I put some more action in, in there? How can I make it more dramatic or, or lead the, the reader through a different path? So, you know, I, it's good to have a, a general trajectory, a, a general plan. And I talk about that a little bit in the book too, of you want to have a success oriented trajectory, but what exactly that looks like, that can change, right? It's just that that general trajectory that you need. Oh, Nate, you muted. There we go. Paul, if people are interested in checking out your book, when will it be available and how can they get a hold of it? It's currently on pre-sale on my website. That's pauljhuber.com. And the J is important. If you if you just go to paulhuber.com, you get someone else <laughs> okay. um, who's a locksmith. But if you go to pauljhuber.com, it's got my book on pre-sale. It's $16.99 right now. It'll be on Amazon in a while. I've okay. got I've got a sample of the cover in from... I, I'm working with a kind of an, in, an independent publishing house. And I know there's, there's at least a few other people in the church I've talked to that, that are interested in writing books. And the way it's been working with me, for me with this group is I, I got what I thought was done and then met up with this publisher. And she's like, well, I, I help people do independent publishing. And she walked me through the process a little bit. She's got someone who does, cover design. So now I've got a great looking professional cover that's way beyond my skill level in Photoshop. And, and they're working on the interior right now. So that's the next big milestone. Uh, I have all the text there together and, and written up and formatted pretty decently, but they'll make it really look professional. Yeah. And so there's a few more process steps we have to get through. It'll go on uh, Amazon pretty soon and we'll get it up there. But it is certainly on online for pre-order right now. So I froze up for just a second. Sorry, if it's <laughs> me over on the other side. But um, I, I just want to applaud you, Paul, because writing a book is it's an accomplishment because it takes work. Like a lot of people have an idea of writing a book. All of us, there's many people that want to write a book, but you have to do it. I mean, you just do. It's it's about yeah. doing. Um, it's there's no other. It doesn't magically appear. It is a right. it's sweat. And I know we talked a lot of Saturdays where you were hanging out at the coffee shop and mm -hmm. right working and getting it done. And that's pretty awesome. 
Um, hey, I, there's a quote in your book I want to read, and uh, maybe talk about this for a second. It says success produces sustainable benefits in a way that charity cannot. Charity is important, but it relies on the overflow of success. The process of successful commerce benefits all who are involved in producing it, resulting in the ability to produce even more. Um, what, what are your thoughts behind that? Because I think, you know, sometimes we don't always think of, you know, success and charity and, and the components that go together with that. But how, how's that, how's that worked for you? How have right. you worked in living that out? Well, that, that's really kind of the, the capitalist extension of give a man a fish and feed him for a day and, and teach him to fish and, and um, feed him for a lifetime. It, it's really taking that to the next step of, well, teach them how to run a fishing business, how, teach them how to build something of value. And one of the great examples I saw of this, and I want to thank uh, Tom Papelka for telling me about the book, is in a book called Beginner's Pluck. And the the author wanted to help women in Africa get an education because it was so important to her that they be able to go to school because that is the gateway for, for further success in where they're trying to, to get in, the, in the, that African country she was in. And she said, well, I, I only have so much money, but she figured out how to make a sandal business where the women in the community in Africa worked together to build, to make sandals that then were exported to the United States and sold. And, and now she's been growing that business. And that, that's something where that author and, and other people, they can give, they can give, but they can only give so much. And yes, there's, there's great abundance that many of us have that allows us to give, but by being able to set that community up to sustain what they're doing, that's something that they, they provide value to others and then they get income and then they can go to college. And that, you know, that's really what it's all about is you provide value to someone else and they provide value to you. And it started with bartering, but now the, the best form of that is money. You, you provide a, a good or service, they pay you, and then you can go do something with that. And so yeah. that, that, that's a great sustainable way to, to build in developing countries, especially. So in work I've done, one of the things that we've added a phrase at the end. So if you, you know, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, teach a man a fish, you feed him for a lifetime, but help the man own the pond. Who is it that owns the pond? Because otherwise they're still indentured to someone else. And, uh, you know, it kind of reminds me, I, I told the story a little bit, but different than a couple of years ago, I got to be at the presidential prayer breakfast. And, uh, on one side of me, I'm sitting with Dennis Prager. He's hanging, he's on that side. Some, a lot of people know. I had no idea who he was at that point, other than people were coming up and taking pictures with him, which is a no-no in that setting for anybody. Because there's a lot of big names, but for Dennis, they wanted to do it. Um, real nice guy. I mean, but I was more interested in the conversation I had with the guy on my right, um, who grew up in, he, as he called it, a street rat in Mumbai, India. And he goes, I learned to code I like every street rat in Mumbai we learned to code and uh, got a job in a company worked well um, got moved around internationally married a girl from Venezuela when he was living in Venezuela for a while and when I met him because he, he was now retired at 43 years old um, he built a company sold it and will never have to work another day in his life and uh, then went back to work for a, an international Piece. And, and like this is where I think that comes from, right? Because he's able to give back. So he signed a five-year contract for $5 um, to be, he called it, he goes, yeah, I'm a, I'm a volunteer CEO of a nonprofit in Africa. So it's one of the nations in Africa where they're working on other community. But he was really quick to tell me, he goes, I hate charity. Right? I, I hate charity. Um, charity is terrible. So what we're doing, even if it's just a dollar in, people have skin in the game and I want them to help. I want them to own the pond in a sense, as what he was saying. And he was teasing at one point. He said, oh, no, I'm three years into my contract and I haven't seen a penny from them yet. So I'm hoping <laughs> good for the $5 at the end of the five years. <laughs> but to have that, that concept of, of being able to give back right out of the overflow and the abundance of, of the lives that can change. Now there's a whole you know, hundreds of thousands of people that are going to benefit 
from his capacity to get the best yield out of what God had given him and now flowing back in there through, through life, which, which I love that, love that concept. So it isn't mm. it's teach them to fish, teach them, but also help them have ownership because ownership is critical. Right. Um, let's see. I love it. Bobby Joe's giving us some, he's got some dreams and I love them. They're, they're pretty awesome. I want to encourage you to keep chasing them. Yeah, there are some things because I think that's the other piece maybe fall on this is sometimes people have a dream and it's dream is plan A. But a lot of times we have to start with plan G and we have to work up to plan A. Um, but what can you do that'll start now that you can do with the time you have, with the resources you have, with the capacity you have that'll get you started on that path to plan A. Um, if, if you kind of, I know, and even the other group that you've been a part of, how's, how have those kind of decisions or conversations been? Cause it's kind of an entrepreneurial startup kind of talk. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, there was a great example and I was able to, to talk to him a little bit about it uh, a week or so ago where he talks about David and, and I, I talk about this a lot is, you know, David, yeah, he was anointed young as the future king of Israel, but he had a lot to do to, to walk into that calling. Yep. He, he got that anoint, anointing and then he went back to being a shepherd. And, you know, those bad days as a shepherd when a lion or a bear comes in and, and tries to take your sheep, he didn't complain about it. He just took care of the bear and the sheep and, yep. and or the, the bear and the lion. And he was able to um, hone his skills. I'm, I'm sure he spent many days of boredom just with that slingshot, killing some trees and bushes and, and shrubbery. And, and, and then eventually the, the bears did come as they do. And, and the, the predators come and tr try to take his sheep and he took care of them. And by working through that, he was prepared to go meet Goliath. And when he met Goliath, he, he brought basically a gun to a knife fight, right? And a guy in armor is, at least in my mind, a lot less scary than a lion, right? But the lion can run a lot faster. He can catch a gazelle. I can't catch a gazelle. <laughs> but he's got that slingshot and he's there ready to take out Goliath and his brothers and, and anyone else that'll come because he spent that time preparing. He spent the time preparing when it wasn't important, when it wasn't a high pressure situation. Losing a sheep here or there sometimes happens, but he was ready for it. And when it was really important, when it was important for the kingdom of Israel, he was there to take out Goliath. And when, when King Saul had his terrible headaches and, and was afflicted, he was there in the king's court learning about what went on and learning about that royal lifestyle and, and what happened. And so he's there soothing the king, but also taking advantage of what God had called him to do at the time and, and learning about the situation. And he, he learned to become a warrior. He learned all the many things about becoming a king long before that was his responsibility. And that was kind of his ultimate responsibility and his ultimate calling. But along the way, there were a lot of stepping stones and he was faithful in meeting those stepping stones. And I, I think that's so important. It, if, our, if our lifelong plan is to get to that big goal, that, that goal Z, milestone Z, you have to get through A, B and C before that. Yeah. And yeah, sometimes it changes. You have to go to plan B or C, but you have to work through that, that process of achieving your goals and growing into that ultimate calling that you've got. Yeah. Last year, last question here, Paul, what advice would you give to someone who feels like maybe they're in that shepherd season where they feel like they have these big dreams? Maybe they even got a startup like, you know, David was anointed. Then he went back to doing what he was doing for a long time until that Goliath moment. What, what's, you know, what's the short answer to, to give some advice to someone who feels like they're in that season and they feel like they're not going anywhere or growing? Uh, absolutely challenge yourself during that situation. I know right now it's, it's easy to pull back and to kind of relax through the quarantine. Yep. I haven't had that luxury. I've been an essential uh, employee and had to 
I've worked at my day job every day online and, and telecommuted mostly to my work. But I think there's this tendency of, hey, enjoy the moment, relax a little bit, yeah. but press in. Uh, the number one thing to do is take care of yourself, make sure you're healthy, and then work on yourself. Yeah. If you, if you yeah, can't get into the office, you know, do something that will help you improve and challenge yourself. And, and to the extent possible, find someone to come alongside you. Uh, yeah. it, sometimes it can be hard. Sometimes that person alongside you has to come through a book or, or other media, but get someone beside you and, and work with someone that will challenge you. If you mm -hmm. can't challenge yourself, find one, someone that will challenge you and just kind of push through and, and work on it. Yeah. And, and don't that. be afraid of, of the, the pain of the workout because the bigger muscles come on the other side of that. Exactly. I mean, David, I'm sure there were moments when he was a shepherd, he had to kill complacency. He could have just sat around, like you said, killing trees, right? He probably worked on his craft, but mm -hmm. it was because he wasn't complacent. He didn't just sit down and, and just wait for the kingdom to come. He got better when that moment was at his doorstep, he was ready. And, uh, and so I, I just appreciate your time here, Paul. Thank you so much for answering our questions again. Make sure you go and uh, pre-order Paul Huber's book, Killing Complacency. Pastor Brian, I want to give you the last word here tonight. No, I appreciate it. I love it, man. We've been talking about this for a long time. I love being able to put this together and taking the time. For those who are joined online, whether on Zoom, and I know we've got several on YouTube, we're going to jump over to the prayer service at 7 o'clock. Love for you to join us for that. But we just really like having opportunities like this just to connect and to encourage each other more conversational and help us dig in and learn. So man, we just want to, we believe you, Paul, appreciate it and love it. And uh, we encourage you for what's coming next. So um, I don't think if anybody, I think we're good. So I think we're going to wrap it up and we'll, we'll tell everyone we'll see you soon. Like I said, right. reminder, church is going to be back June 7th. So we'll services and we're going to try to make sure that we can separate time so some people we're going to need some people to come to the one o'clock service so we don't get too full because uh, we do have to still practice you know all of our social distancing through this and we're limited for the capacity of the excuse me of the room uh, but we're we're moving forward here we go all right cool thanks for having me all right all right well we'll see y'all later thanks everybody good night for